Hiya folks, Strategic Wolf here and welcome back to the final video in our Tips for Beginner series. Today I'm going to give you a few final tips and I'm going to showcase one of the biggest secrets in Gwent that you beginners will have no idea even exists and how much this secret affects your actual games. Okay, now before we jump into it, if you find this video helpful, I'm going to ask you to leave a like and also to subscribe, folks, to support the channel, please, and thank you. Also, feel free to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both links will be in the description of this video. All right, folks, let's jump in, do these few final tips, and then the secret. Shh, shh, shh. All right, folks, so the first thing I want to talk to you about is tempo. You'll hear people talk about high tempo, low tempo, good tempo, bad tempo. Do like the terms good and bad because there's no really such thing as bad tempo. It's, you're always going to get points. So it's just, I, I like to say high or low tempo. Now what tempo essentially means is getting points on your side of the board or removing points on the opponent's side in as few actions as possible. So for example, playing a card is one action. So the more points a card gives you, the higher your tempo. So let's say, for example, if we look at, let's go down to the four provision cards. If we looked at a card like, uh, da, 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 a card like, there, Bridge Trove. Okay, it has a death wish ability, but just ignore that for the moment, okay? Just play this card. One action, playing a card, four points. Okay, that's a monstrous card. If we go to... The other end of the monsters and look at Igor. One action, playing a card, 13 points. 11, no, sorry, 9 points more. I was going to say 11. 9 points more for the same number of actions. Therefore, playing Igor is much higher tempo because it's still one action, but you have 9 more points than playing the bridge. Was it a bridge drill? Bridge drill, wasn't it, I think? Yeah, bridge drill. Okay, that's higher tempo. If we look specifically at, well, specifically at monsters, all cards, I don't own all the cards yet. Um, there, old spear tip, 12 points, one action. All right, uh, old spear tip asleep, nine points in one action. Okay, what else? There's also um, Goliath, where's Goliath? Where's Goliath? Goliath. Oh, he's, oh, he's eight provisions. See, that's not changed. Goliath. Ten points. One action. Okay, monsters have pretty high tempo cards just in themselves. If we look specifically at Northern Realms, look down here at the bottom. If we play uh, Radovid Royal Guard, play it formation, play it on the range row, four points. If it survives, you have the opportunity to give two boost and two armor the next turn. But four provisions for four points, okay? Four points in one action. Pretty pretty low tempo, okay? It has the possibility of being higher tempo if you can trigger the order ability. Look at the top end of the big units. What's one of the biggest things? Drog, probably. Donomir, seven, yeah. Drog, even War Elephant. Falibor, there's Falibor, for example. Seven points, to just ignore the death blow. Deploy damage for three. That's 10 point play one action that's higher tempo now yes you're probably noticing by now that higher tempo cards are the higher provisions and yes that is true for one action things however tempo also links into what we're going to talk about next which is tutoring and thinning so tutoring cards for tutoring our cards there are the main tutors, so those are, let's have a little look here, they are our, they're all down low because they're low power. Here we go. Ferco, playing a crime card. Fav for nature cards. Uh, Wispus for organic cards. Vabjorn for raid cards. Menno for tactic cards. Skellige has two, Ermion for alchemy cards. And John Natalis for warfare cards. Who am I missing? None of them. One, two, three, four, five, six different factions. Yeah, they're all there. 
I have them all. Okay, so let's say for example that our we're playing Skellige. Okay, our opponent plays Northern Realms. They play a Radovit Royal Guard at four power. Okay, play it on the range room. Inspired kicks in. It's at four power. We could play a Gutting Slash from hand. Damage unit by four. We remove that Radovit Royal Guard. Equal even Stevens. Equal exchange. They played four points. We remove four points. However, we could play Vavjorn to tutor a raid card, which Gutting Slash is. Tutor the raid card. Tutor the Gutting Slash from our deck. Remove the uh, Radovit Royal Guard. And in doing so, by playing Vavjorn, put two points on our side of the board. So we still remove their four points, but we also put two on our side. That would be higher tempo. Yes, it's only two points, but hey, sometimes two points can win you a game. Well, sometimes one point can just win you a game. So that would be higher tempo. Also, tutoring a card from our deck thins our deck. So we're not going to draw into a gutting slash later on. All right, you're going to have 15 cards, play Vabjorn, tutor out the gutting slash and be left with 14 cards. Greater chance to draw your other gold cards later on in round two and round three. All right. Tutoring cards also, for example, Alzer's Double Cross. Play the high unit from your deck. So if you're playing a Northern Realms list, Falabor is most likely going to be the highest thing in your deck. Perhaps War Elephant. Okay. Maybe Varaxis Prince. Okay, maybe Donomir. So building your deck specifically and playing a card like Alzer's Double Cross helps you to tutor something specific, as does Marching Orders. If I even typed. Play the lowest unit from your deck. So if you have a Northern Realms list and you have Philip in it, Marching Orders will always draw you Philippa because he's the lowest unit in your deck. That's where smart deck building comes into your tutoring as well. Even so much just as with these guys and girl. If you didn't have any nature cards, Fav wouldn't work. So having nature cards and having a few nature cards in case you draw some in your deck. That therefore means you can tutor cards and thin your deck at the same time. Now, as I said, that also links into tempo. Now I'm going to actually showcase a few extra thinning techniques now that really thin the deck. I'm going to show you them actually on the boards of Gwent and explain how this links into tempo. Let's do that. All right, so here we have some dwarf action, okay? So, Mahakam volunteers deploy, if you control a dwarf, summon all copies of this unit from your deck to this row. So this is one of your thinning cards, okay? If we look in our deck, which we have, we have 16 cards, an extra card, we have another Mahakam volunteer. All right. So, we control, control the dwarf, which we do. We play this. It's going to pull the other volunteer from our deck, thinning our deck by one and also bringing out another four points. So this is not just playing four points, this is actually going to play eight points, okay? There we go. So eight point play. So it's higher tempo, it's thinning. That's the way to do it, folks, okay? Higher tempo and thinning all in one. That's how this all links in together. However, we can actually thin these cards another way, which is even higher tempo. And I'll show you that right now. All right. This time, both volunteers are in the deck. One, two. This time, we're going to thin both out. Therefore, thinning our deck by two. It's all by two cards, sorry. It's also going to be a much higher tempo play because we're going to get more points on our side of the board. Now, Novogradian Justice. Play a Bronze Dwarf or Crown Splitter unit from your deck. If you already control a Dwarf or Crown Splitter, also spawn a Cleaver's Muscle on the Allied melee row. So, 
We have a dwarf on the board. So, here we go. Play the volunteer. There we go. So this time it wasn't just an 8 point play, it was an 8 plus 5, which is 13. A 13 point play. Thinned our deck by 2 cards, 13 points, a much higher tempo play. Alright, this time with Skellige, our thinning card is Drummond Shield Maiden. When this unit is damaged, summon all copies of it from your deck to this row. We have one other Shield Maiden in our deck. Okay. So, let's play this. Use a leader ability of Ursine Ritual. Damage an other unit by one. Thins our deck by one. Seven points. Okay, using up all the charges, however, is beneficial because then we get a bear abomination once all the charges are used up. So it's a good a bit, a good bit of synergy with the uh, self wound Skellige package. All right, so that's the first way of thinning the shield maidens. Now let me show you the better way. This time, both shield maidens are in the deck. We're gonna play Ceres and Create. On the melee row, deploy, spawn a Drummond Shield Maiden in this row. Then use a leader charge to damage the Shield Maiden spawned by Ceres and thin the other two from the deck. Here we go. Also thins out Roach, forgot about that. Also thins Roach, so you played a gold card, forgot about that. There we go. Now, we take off the three points of Roach. Forgot Roach was in this deck. Take off the three points. 15 points. 15 points. This time thinned two cards. Ignore the Roach. We've thinned two cards. Two Shield Maidens. 15 points. Much higher tempo. In this case, with this deck, which I even forgot what was in, what was in this deck, we also have Roach. That also thins. Thinned an extra card. That's greater tempo as well. So there you go. That's the better way of ignore the roach. Ignore the roach. That's the better way of thinning shield maidens. Much higher tempo. All right. Now it's secret time. So the secret I'm going to share with you beginners is card positioning. Now you may have heard of card positioning, but you won't realize the actual effect it has on the resolution of your end turn. Abilities. That's what I'm going to showcase for you now with a few specific examples. Now, somewhere on one of the loading screens, we have the tips that appear up, you know, the, at the bottom. Somewhere it says something along the lines of end turn abilities resolve melee row to range row, left to right, something like that, front to back, left to right, okay? Something along those lines. But what does that actually mean? Well, folks, I'm going to show you. All right. So I'm going to show you this scenario three different times with three different positioning of these cards. Specifically, the Lubricant or Botchling. Botchling transforms into Lubricant. Okay, I'm going to play the Lubricant here, then here, and then here. And show you the impact and difference this has on the end turn. Okay, now we're going to play Oniromancy to play Anna Stranger. In between, between the two Trident infantry. Now everything here is five power. A Lubberkin, every allied turn on turn N, boost the lowest allied unit by one. Anna at four will be the lowest allied unit. So she will get a boost up to five. This will inspire her. Anna's end turn ability, every ally turn on turn end, boost the unit to the right by one. Inspired, boost adjacent units by one instead. So, by reading all that, what should happen at the end of this turn is, Anna will be played in the middle, the turn will end, this will boost Anna, and Anna will boost both the Trident infantries. However, she will not. Even though she will be at five power, and she will be inspired, she will not boost both Trident infantries this end turn. Why not? Because end turn abilities resolve front to back, left to right. 
So at the end of the turn, the game's code goes right. Melee row. Oh, no cards. Okay. Move back. Range row. Trident. If this unit receives a boost, damage an enemy unit by one. Anna. Boost the unit to the right. Inspired. Boost adjacent units. But Anna will not be inspired yet because the Lubberkin is to the right of Anna. So Anna's end turn ability resolves before the Lubberkin. So Anna will only boost this Trident infantry. Then the game moves on, looks at Lubberkin. Oh, lowest unit. Oh, the lowest ally unit is Anna at four. Booster. That's what's going to happen. It's going to play Anna. This will not be boosted. This will boost. See? See that? Only this one boosted. Because the game went left to right. The botchling boosted Anna after her end turn ability had already resolved. Let's do it again, folks, with a Lubberkin in a different position. This time we have the Lubberkin to the left on the range row. So at the end of the turn, when I pass, turn will end, the game's code will go melee row, oh no cards, move back, range row, Lubberkin, boost the lowest allied unit. A six, a four, oh that's Anna. So Anna will become inspired. This time, at the end turn, Anna will boost both of the tridoms, okay? There we go. Both boosted. Because the Lubberkin resolved before Anna this time. Let me show you once more. All right, this time the Lubberkin is on the melee row. So when I use a Neuromancy to play Anna in between, she'll be the lowest unit at four. The game's code at the end of the turn will go, oh, melee row, Lubberkin. Boost the lowest ally unit by one. Oh, that's Anna. It will boost her. Then it will go back to the range row and resolve all the abilities on the range row. So this time, same as when the Lubberkin was to the left, its end turn resolves before Anna's. So Anna is inspired and therefore will boost both of the Trident infantry. Here we go. There you go. See that? That, folks, is card positioning. So here, playing the Lubberkin to the right, Anna only boosted one. Playing the Lubberkin to the left, or the melee row, Anna boosts both. Because the end turn ability of the Lubberkin resolves, inspiring Anna before her end turn ability resolves. That, folks, is a secret that not many people actually know and you beginners definitely will not know. Shh. Let me show you one more scenario, folks. Now we'll wrap up this video. Okay, in this scenario, we're going to use two cards. All right, Tax Collector, ranged every ally turn on turn end, gain one coin. Pass the floor of Peaches, horde of two, at the end of your turn, boost self by one. So I'm going to play the Peaches in three different places. First in the melee row, then to the left of the tax collector and then to the right of the tax collector so i'm going to play it on the melee row now what's going to happen is the game's code is going to look at the passive floor peaches on the melee row it's going to go oh horde of two at the end of your turn boost self by one it's going to look at our little coin coin pouch and just go oh you only have one coin then it will move back to the range row oh tax collector range row yes gain one coin so at the end of this turn, we will end up with two coins, but the Peaches will not boost because its end turn ability resolves before we get the extra coin from the tax collector. Watch this. And the turn. We gain a coin. We have two coins. This did not boost. Let me show you two more times. This time, I've played the passive floor of Peaches on the range row, but to the left of the tax collector. So once again, we will end up with two coins at the end of this turn, but this will not boost 
because this end turn ability, the game's code goes melee row, open all cards, move back, range row, peaches, horde of two, nope, only one, sorry, no boost. Oh, tax collector, range, gain a coin. So we'll end up with two coins, but the peaches will not boost once again. There we go. Let me show you one more time. This time I've played the peaches to the right of the tax collector. At the end of the turn, the game's code goes melee row, oh no cards, move back, range row. Yes, you tax collector on the range row, gain a coin. You'll have two coins in the pouch. Then it moves to the peaches, hoard two, oh yes, two coins, boost self by one. So on this end turn, the, tax, the peaches will boost by one. This is where card positioning really, really comes into play. There we go, folks. There we go. All right, folks, that's it. That's our tips series finished. Hope you found this helpful. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you for watching. Do forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed and find it helpful. And as always, take care of yourselves, folks. Bye bye for now.